Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We're really excited because this is Drill Down Day 2 with one of our absolute favorites, LaShonda Williams, one of the trainers at Fundraising Academy. LaShonda's coming to us today from the greater Houston area talking about ethics in nonprofit fundraising. This is such a big topic that we've put it into two days so that we can really kind of explore this and, and really get a grip on it. Um, LaShonda and I were talking in the green room. It's something that you only hear about or talk when there's a talk about when there's a problem, which is the wrong time to do something like this. So um, we're excited to kind of get on this, this bandwagon of really drilling down and figuring out what it is. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom will not be with us today. Um, she started off this morning with us, but then she kept freezing up, so we had to kick her off, just kicked her off, but she'll be back with us tomorrow. We are here because we have amazing partners day in and day out. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, where we uh, have LaShonda Williams, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. If you want to access any of the 900 plus episodes, we got you covered. You can find us on streaming broadcasts, plot, uh, podcast formats, as well as our, our new and fabulous app. So just scan that QR code and we'll be right with you. And uh, you can access all of the different content that we have. More importantly, we have the content queen herself, LaShonda Williams, trainer at Fundraising Academy. If you were with us in the green room, LaShonda, really quickly talk to us about your quote unquote day job, because I think this is a fascinating tie in to the whole topic of ethics. So, yes, as we mentioned earlier, I'm so excited to be a part of South Texas College of Law, and I work in the Office of Philanthropy and Alumni Engagement. And I was sharing with Julia earlier, it's really important that we maintain ethical behavior top of mind throughout the year, not just when we're highlighting Ethics Month with AFP. Um, ethics is in everything we do. It's in every part of the cause selling cycle as well as the donor cycle. So in every aspect, as we're engaging with prospective donors, as well as current donors, we have to be mindful of our actions because our actions have tremendous implications, not only on us as individual professionals, but also organizations. And so I'm really excited to dive in on this topic and talk about some things that you know we've seen before and some ways that we can be proactive as opposed to reactive as we're transitioning and preparing for the new year. You know, I love that. And yesterday you kind of started us off with understanding what ethics actually, what that framework is. And, you know, it, the concept of moral principles that govern, govern behaviors. As you spoke throughout the morning, I realized it was so behavior oriented, so it, behavior oriented. It is completely behavior driven. So as fundraising professionals, it's our responsibility to make sure that we maintain higher levels of ethics. And that means truthfulness, honesty, transparency. These are all paramount because donors and prospective donors entrust us with their confidential information. They entrust us <laughs> with their resources, both time and money. It is our responsibility to maintain due diligence and adhering to what it is that they'd like for us to do with their resources and the way that we handle and manage their resources. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you phrase it that way, I'm reminded that for so many donors and corporate partnerships, arrangements, it's the front facing person from development that really navigates that relationship through the whole organization. So, you know, you might think I'm representing, you know, this process, but in truth, you're really representing an entire organization. I mean, do you find that to be true? Yes, absolutely. Whenever you are in the development space, 
no matter what role that you play within the organization, you are truly reflective of the organization. And so you want to be mindful of things like your social media. Um, as of late, you may have noticed that a lot of companies and nonprofit organizations have mad, made a tremendous shift in identifying what their code of ethics and what their mission statement and value statements are to ensure that we are aware of what the expectations are as it relates to social media, for example. Yeah. Granted, your social media is your page. However, what you place on your page um, does have implications with your organization. So when you're thinking about it from a professional development person, whether you are the administrative associate or you're the vice president of the organization, you really want to keep in mind that you want to kind of limit what your social media looks like in and ask yourself, what would the perception of our organization look like? You know, if I post something that's derogatory, granted, you know, I work at a law school, freedom of speech is very important. <laughs> However, <laughs> yeah. Face that we work in, we have to be mindful because we um, what we say impacts our organizations and it could potentially impact the outcomes, whether yeah. it be a prospective donor current donor, we won't, don't want to necessarily offend someone. So having these statements of expectations within the organization's um, infrastructure is really important to guide the behavior across the, across the organization, as well as set the standards so that there's little room for ambiguity when it comes to my social media page, because it does have implications. Yeah, you know, that's a really good comment. And I think especially as we navigate towards a general election in this country, um, it's going to become stickier and, and more volatile. Um, and it just does. It just happens, I think, in general, no pun intended, with a general election. So, you know, I think that's a good reminder. I want to jump into another good reminder. And you mentioned this yesterday, and that's the AFP Association of Fundraising Professionals Code of Ethics. And you, yes. referenced this, you referenced this yesterday, but a lot of our guests have referenced this, continue to reference this. Talk to us about this, the ecosystem of this and what it means to you and how it impacts our sector. So AFP has done a dynamic job in providing that foundation for fundraising professionals to have a guide to adhere to, to think about how you are engaging not only your donors, but also your colleagues in the industry. And so, you know, I mentioned earlier on the front end that it's really important to maintain that high level of transparency, which is important as you're engaging and being entrusted to uh, manage Funds. But in addition to that, when we're talking about the transparency, we want to make sure that when donors make gifts, that those gifts are in fact going to those designations. And it is our responsibility to provide donors with feedback and a follow-up of stewardship of how those funds are being spent. And, you know, the stickiest part of the conversation when it comes to funding and transparency is what percentage is operational expenses yes. versus those that are actually impactful to the organization's mission. So it's really important that when we are preparing these annual reports and when we're sharing back with donors that we're being very transparent. Mm -hmm. um, some organizations, depending on your structure, may have operational resources and 100% of donations are being used to said services. But in instances where that is not your organizational structure, it is our responsibility and it falls in line with code of ethics that we share that, you know, X percentage of every dollar raise may be um, going, up, going towards operational expenses. This helps build trust. And most importantly, the transparency will allow donors to make the decision as to which organizations they want to support and or which causes they want to support. You know, it's so interesting you bring this up. I had lunch with um, an executive director of an organization who last week out of just left field, um, their, their small organization received a $100,000 gift. And um, which for this organization was a transformational gift, right? And I would argue for many organizations, it would be a transformational gift. And it had very specific applications of use. Mm -hmm. And none of it was for operations. And it was for things that were good and that were great, but truly the organization 
could make themselves more sustainable if they took some of those funds and put them towards operations and stuff like that. And so they were taking this week to try and figure out how to go back to the donor and without appearing to be like, we can't take this unless we get that, you know, like basically educating the donor and, and trying to figure out the vocabulary for that and, and very fearful, very fearful that they were going to lose the whole gift. So I would say, don't be afraid. And this is this is where I go back to saying prevention. So it's really important as you are developing the relationship with the donor, as you're sharing the impact of the various services that your organization provide, that you also include the importance of operational expenses to ensure those said outcomes, because without some initial resources, it's impossible in many instances. And also, you know, I, I do this all the time and I love annual giving. That's my thing. <laughs> I am the annual fund guru. Um, and there are instances where specifically at the end of the year is a great time to implement um, an annual giving or an end of year campaign for unrestricted resources. And one yeah. of the ways to do that is, you know, we, we often look for those larger gifts that are transformational, which are great. Um, but in the world, of the philanthropic landscape, all gifts are important and all gifts matter. And we treat all donors like a major gift donor. This is an opportunity to solicit, reach out to those individuals who may not be able to make the more substantial gifts. However, they're able to give modest gifts based on their income. And those are instances in which you would solicit for that unrestricted giving. And then to be able to say, because of this unrestricted giving, we've been able to provide these types of resources to to support said programs that have been funded by Julia. You know what? I love that. And I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about it that way as, you know, directly at the same time, you are educating donors. Um, you're kind of helping everything look like it's, it's more forward thinking and the stewardship and the sustainability of an organization. That's brilliant. My friend, that's a really cool way to, kind of look at this with a, a more holistic approach. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's an amazing thing. Well, one of the things that you also talked to us about is bringing truth to donors. And I find this is a, th a really interesting thing because it's like, you don't want to look like you need the money, but you need the money. And yet you don't want to bring up the bad things that are going on. And you and you said like, you know, your fear and yet, you have fear and it's like, but how do you bring all of God, how do you put this all together and bring this truth to the donors? Yeah. You know, it sometimes is a slippery slope, but when we're thinking about it from an ethical and moral standard and what we're practicing within a consistent, on a consistent basis, it becomes effortless and okay. transparency and truth they work in tandem mm -hmm. and it's critical that we make sure that we're very forthcoming and forthcoming in many instances, you know, there may be an instance where you mentioned the, the scenario with they're not necessarily being able to um, implement the program without the operational expenses. That's the perfect example. But mm -hmm. moreover, if there are instances when a potential funder wants to support your organization and create a new initiative that is not in alignment with your organization's mission statement, with its values. Unfortunately, you know, you have to be very truthful and just simply say, you know, this is great. Um, we would love to pursue this, but unfortunately that's not in alignment with our current mission, you know, our, or, you know, and be very, very kind and considered about that. Um, you want to be forthcoming and not over deliver, you know, over promise on things that you simply cannot deliver. It minimizes any potential challenges that are in the future and it prevents any problems forthcoming. Just like we have gift acceptance policies, there are also donor acceptance policies yeah. as well that you could have in place if yeah. individuals who want to support your organization may not necessarily maintain a high ethical moral value that you'd like to be associated with your organization. So being able to have those difficult conversations is one of the benefits of our responsibility and our opportunity to work in the development space. Now, I got to ask you this, how often in your career, um, and you're a bright, shiny star, so I realize, you know, you're, you're different than the majority of us in this, in this sector, but how often have you personally had to do this? 
So I will speak specifically of one example that um, in my career, we had a prospective donor mm -hmm. and we weren't really certain of the said resources that wanted to sponsor an endowment. And mm -hmm. so Granted, in the need discovery phase and the discovery phase, as you're getting to know the prospective donor, you're asking questions, probing questions, intentional questions to be able to make a complete donor profile. But when it came to actual resources, we had a little ambiguity and we had to little, dig a little deeper. And not only did we have to dig a little deeper, I had to ask some subsequent questions because the last thing I wanted to do was to put our organization at risk to being affiliated with someone who potentially may not have um, earned those resources um, from a morale standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, with additional due diligence, we discovered that the individual actually, you know, had been, you know, very well to do, but literally below the radar. And there are instances where individuals will hide some of their resources through yeah. a variety of different investments. So, you know, I would say do your due diligence, which is most important. And that's where your prospect researcher comes into play. And then you as a development professional asking the essential questions. Mm -hmm. You know, years ago, I sat on the board of uh, one of the nation's largest domestic violence shelters, and we had a, a, a very wealthy donor come in and who we had no engagement with, none. And this donor wanted to make a, a huge gift that would have changed mm -hmm. the course of this, this amazing organization. But um, they had a family member that was involved in a very high profile domestic violence issue. And half of the board felt like this individual was trying to get behind, um, you know, a, a PR issue. Right. And we do not want to be someone's PR pawn. <laughs> no, it was really. And then, you know, part of the board was like, well, maybe this donor's trying to make amends and set a course because they don't believe. I mean, it was hard. It was a heartbreaking time. It was a heartbreaking time because so many things would have changed with that gift. And um, but you brought up a very good point. You know, having a strong board that is well informed and educated on the morality issues and having a code of ethics established for the organization can play a critical role, again, in erring on the side of prevention and being willing to ask those questions that may not make us feel as comfortable, but are essential. And yeah. so, you know, you're what you said is like absolutely perfect. And, you know, that's that's the perfect scenario is to be able to not be afraid to have those conversations, because, again, there's ethics in everything we do. And when we make the wrong decision, unfortunately, it's it's really hard to recover our reputation. It takes years to build a strong reputation <clears throat> Of, you know, being high performing, impactful, above yeah, yeah. board, and then all it takes is one horrible PR issue, and then your organization can um, unfortunately reap horrible consequences and no longer be able to secure funding. Yeah, you know, Lashonda is part of truth, and I and I know this is kind of a little bit of a curveball, and but um, how do you navigate the relationship with a donor who who really loves you? And they trust you. And because you are representing the organization, they probably, you know, they probably make larger gifts or more um, engaged gifts. And then let's say you go somewhere else or let's say you you navigate to a different part of the sector. What does that look like? Because to me, that's a, that's another ethical issue that involves truth. You're right. It is an ethical issue. So. First, we must be mindful that relationships that we form on behalf of the organization belong to the organization. And so that's the first thing from an ethical standpoint that you want to keep top of mind. Um, there have been instances where I have transitioned roles and, you know, people do love LaShonda, yeah. um, but it's important. And I, LaShonda loves people, but it's <laughs> also important when you are, you know, when you're transitioning out and you may be, you know, sending out the letter saying, you know, I'm no longer going to be with this organization. There are some instances where you form, form genuine relationships yeah. and you want to stay connected to those set donors. From an ethical standpoint, you must first and foremost ask if they'd like to maintain communication because donors have a right to privacy 
And we want to respect those donors' rights to privacy. And the second part is as you're conducting yourself, if you carry forward that relationship on a personal note outside of that organization, from an ethical standpoint, you are not to be soliciting those individuals on behalf of that new organization. If the donor asks about the organization, that's fine for them to lead and guide that conversation. But keeping in mind the, the relationship in which you form that that relationship on the organization, it belongs to the organization. Right. And I've carried many people with me, but as far as cr uh, creating conflicts of interest, that is definitely a no-go. Okay. Well, thank you for that because that's the reality of, you know, how we navigate our, our careers and, you know, organizations. And so that's a, that's an important thing. I want to switch now to something that's, it's, a little, it's like third party, but this is the accountability to the sector with the emphasis on watchdog groups and and how this works and and, and understanding this. I mean, I I only I I kind of think that this doesn't happen unless there's a problem, right? A lot of times we think oh, there's a watchdog group, you know, and you're right. <laughs> so yes. talk about that. Well, it's important that, you know, when we are managing funds as nonprofit organizations that we're reporting with accuracy, as I mentioned earlier, not overinflating um, dollar amounts, but also adhering to whatever your state and local laws are as it relates to charitable contributions and the method in which individuals provide those charitable contributions. But moreover, we have to be mindful that, yes, in fact, there are several organizations that have taken it upon themselves to hold us to a higher level of accountability. Accountability. I mentioned earlier how organizations can have value statements, it can have the moral code and their ethical codes. Well, on the same in that same vein, we also have organizations that kind of help keep us in alignment with what industry standard practices are as it relates to how we are engaging not only the donors, but how we're managing those said funds. And you know, there are a variety of different organizations. I'll start with state and local. I'll also mention the IRS is very important. We're making sure that we're adhering to their guidelines, but also there is charitable giving there um there's also charity manager you know some of us may be on bbb um, and it's important that we take a look on those said websites to see what our ratings are to ensure that we have a good rating and in fact if there are any concerns that have been posted about our organizations that we address those um unfortunately that's a reactive we want to air on proactive yeah. but you know if, we, if we're proactive enough we'll never become a part of the list that is on the list that says that you know there are some compliance and regulatory issues but in the event that there are it's important that we are checking on an annual basis if not biannual finding out how often they're reporting and making sure that if there are any discrepancies that we're clearing those up and that because we want to maintain the reputation of our organization branding is ever everything. And all it takes is one instance, one donor to Google your organization and it have a poor rating on one of the charitable giving websites. And then it could potentially ruin a potential donor relationship. Yeah. Huge. Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing because again, we kind of started this off yesterday. And for those of you joining us, you know, we pulled this information and a lot of these um, uh, topics when we work with fundraising academy from your amazing textbook i have it flagged with a lot of different things um, and if if i'm not mistaken you my friend are working on an, a newer edition that will probably be out at some point in the near future but we when we talk about this um these ethics you brought up yesterday and i just want to revisit it before we let you go quickly um, there really are five questions that you need to be checking off um, if you're not feeling right or if you want to you know, do an exercise about the trajectory of a decision or relationship. And they're pretty simple, but they're pretty complex, right? Depending on where you are. They really are, you know. Yeah. Um, you asked me yesterday about some, you know, examples. And I'm going to start with the very first one. Um, is it legal? So as we're all preparing for the holiday season and we are shoring up our ethical standards and our moral practices, um, one of the things that comes top of mind as an example, and it's stated in the book, is travel, you know? 
travel is very sticky in some instances, um, and it and it hits both on the legal and ethical standpoints. So we talked about you know reporting things that we may see um, that may not be in alignment with what would be considered ethical. And and I say again that if you see something, you must say something. And so with that in mind, as we're traveling throughout the holiday season, you know some of us are state employees, and you're able to get the state rate. I would say err on the side of caution and do not use the state rate if you're not on state business. Um, you know, another example, you know, would be, you know, when, you know, traveling, you know, holistically, you want to make sure that you're, do, you're very mindful of how much you're spending, you know, some institutions and states have a said per diem rate on how much you can spend per day. Um, and then there are instances where there's a little bit of flexibility. And what I would say from an, an ethical standpoint and a moral standpoint, you want to be as cost effective as you can when you are conducting business on behalf of the organization. Earlier, Julia, we talked about the transparency and accountability with reporting, and we don't want to have to share with our donors that we are um, being excessively elaborate in our travel on behalf of business. Um, more often than not, when you're receiving transformational gifts, those donors want those dollars to impact the services and or the designation in which they have determined they would want you to be able to to, to, to uh, allocate those resources. So we want to make sure that we are doing the right thing all the time and we're mindful of what others would say if they would know what it is that we're doing. So acting yeah. in the state of transparency will help you with determining what you believe to be ethically correct and then also having those guiding principles as a reminder, um, whether it be your organization or your personal accountability. Right. It's such an interesting thing because one of the, the questions is, number four, which I think is a, a really interesting way to reframe this. And, and it goes like this, how would I explain my actions to someone else? You and know? if you would have a problem with explaining yeah. and not being able to provide a reasonable, rational right. response, mm -hmm. then that means that you have crossed an ethical and or moral uh, high ground. And it's important that we do um, keep those types of questions in mind because there are instances I know, like everyone else, you know, you want to be live a little lavish, have a great time, but do that on your time right. and not on company resources. Right. Well, and I think that fundraisers and especially people in development offices, they get that knock internally. You know, people that would think, oh, they just go to fancy parties and fancy lunches and fancy dinners. Right. I mean, you've seen that. You yes, know. I've definitely seen it. Um, and it's important too that, you know, with that, and this goes back to reporting, mm -hmm. you know, with that, that we're keeping in mind what percentage we're spending when we're doing events and when we're engaging donors. Um, and I get, I do completely understand the, the, the difference uh, when you are engaging higher net worth donors, there are mm -hmm. levels of expectations and we want to make sure that we adhere to them, but we also want those high net worth donors to understand that we are mindful of resources and that we are uh, good stewards of resources that have been allocated. Yeah, absolutely. I think it speaks volumes. I really, really do. Well, LaShonda Williams, I, I always, God, I always learn something from you. And at the same time, I'm very inspired. Um, you're not a hair on fire kind of woman. You're very direct and like, you, you know, you're always so logical. And I think that just helps elevate our profession tremendously. And, you know, when when we started this show nearly three years ago, that was like one of our, our really foundational desires was how do we elevate our profession um, so that everybody wins? And, and you're, I think, that incredible voice coming to us from Fundraising Academy. You know, LaShonda is part of an amazing team and there is tremendous, tremendous content, free content. You can find it at uh, fundraising-academy.org. And you'll be amazed how many resources there are for you as individuals, for teams, for boards, um, leadership, CEOs. It's an amazing, amazing thing. So make sure you check out fundraising academy dot org because you will be better for it. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd herself will be back joining us tomorrow. Hey, you know, 
truly, we are grateful every day for our partners, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, National University's Amazing Fundraising Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. They are the folks that stand behind us day in and day out. And they've been part of this two-day drill down as we really explore ethics in the nonprofit sector, what it means to us, how it, it impacts our world, our, our donors, and our clients. LaShonda, thank you. This is really powerful and a great way to end the year so that we can start the year right. You're spot on. It's been a fantastic day with you as always. Very excited. And as Julia mentioned, make sure you check out the portal and save the date, May 1st and 2nd, Cultivate Conference Year 2. We're very excited to bring it to you from Sunday, San Diego. It'll be amazing. I think we're going to be broadcasting live from there and yes. maybe even participating in some of your talks and so it's going to be a lot of fun and as we get more and uh, more information about it we'll share that help me before we let you go you do have uh you you do have speaker a call for speakers open right now yes call for speakers are open right now we're definitely looking for speakers to talk to speak on a variety of different topics that are current trends, which include AI, annual giving, major gifts, um, developing fundraising plans, um, engaging boards. So there's a variety of different topics that we are seeking a uh, call for proposals for and check us out on LinkedIn Fundraising Academy. Awesome. We love it. Well, my friend, have a wonderful holiday. Thank you for inspiring so many of us. Um, today was no different. Um, very, very inspirational and very, very important work. Hey, everybody, as we end every episode, we leave with this message, and it goes like this. To stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Thank you, Miss LaShonda. 